welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for, for coming, spending some time uh, so late in the day. Uh, my name is Benjamin Hodge, and uh, just, just quickly about this talk, uh, it's a little bit difficult to explain in just a short abstract. I just want to make sure you understand what uh, this session is about and that it will be useful for you. If it doesn't sound like what you expected and you want to get up and go to another room, it doesn't matter. I'm a confident guy. I can, I can handle the rejection. But I, I, there's so many good topics, right? I don't want you to waste your time if it's not what you expect. So in this session today, there's no code. Uh, it's really sharing uh, experiences we had uh, moving to a, yeah, it's okay, you can. <laughs> uh, going to a, a, a DevOps model and uh, looking to move to a continuous delivery model, but in the face of lots of legacy stuff, not, not the nicer greenfield, uh, we are not Netflix, so we don't have lots of money. We don't necessarily have the skills, so really some things that we did wrong, some things we did right, ways to really start from zero, right? Really go from we do everything uh, manually or scripted or through traditional ops. Uh, and if we get time, I'll also share some information about uh, some customer projects uh, that have had uh, challenges as well and uh, some things that have really gone wrong there. So, everybody's still here? Okay. Now you can't, uh, you can't blame me. Uh, so one thing, uh, my slides look a little bit strange because about one week ago, I saw a tweet about another conference where someone mentioned Sketchnote. Uh, I went and found out what that was and I really liked it. I thought it was a bit of fun. So uh, you will soon uh, know more about that, but <laughs> okay. Yeah, this uh, seems to be, it does not like me to walk. Okay. Um, also, if I am speaking too fast and get a bit too excited or something like that, I need to slow down, uh, especially for our uh, international audience. Please just uh, wave and uh, let me know. Okay, so kind of four main themes uh, I want to, to cover, or four main sort of lessons around uh, designing for failure, and uh, we will get to some interesting stories there from last week. Um, designing the, the infrastructure that you are going to use. Uh, about testing uh, and about sort of architecture design and keeping loose linkages and dependencies between the things that you uh, you start to make. Okay, so I called it from zero to four deployments per week. Uh, that really came from Chrissy's uh, talk last year where she had the goal to hit 200,000 uh, transactions per second. So we were getting started, it's like, Four deployments a week is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and uh, Friday we relax a little bit. Uh, I mapped here each deployment we did per week along with some key events, and you can see we, we peaked at three, so we haven't got there yet. Uh, we had some, uh, some issues with Azure recently and also a bunch of uh, database changes. Um, this was quite interesting. Uh, each, so each color is a different environment. Uh, the crosses is when uh, the deployment failed. So we at least seem to be getting, we had some clustering and then uh, quite long, uh, just one. Um, each of these is a fairly major change, uh, not so much a change to the application, because obviously that happens every release, but things like changes in dependencies, changes in the infrastructure design, uh, schema changes, things like that. And uh, this is a big fire here. This is the time uh, two weeks ago when I deleted the production database. So that was, uh, that was fun. So I, I kind of, I was a little bit uh, unhappy that I didn't reach the, the four per week. Uh, but I think uh, that's sort of part of this is I could have got a nice chart to four by cheating and just uh, cutting corners again. Um, but that's really against the, the whole point of this transformation is to be very disciplined in how we work and not to set an arbitrary goal or KPI, right? And really focus on uh, delivering, delivering something back to the business. So not quite there yet, but hopefully soon. So the first uh, thing I wanna focus on is just enough in infrastructure. Mr. Snowball likes uh, just enough things. Just enough infrastructure. We, we really, got caught up in all the different tool chains, all the different technologies. Even you start to get involved 
You need JSON, you need YAML, you need XML for different configuration types and data structures. Uh, you need to learn a whole bunch of technology and you actually end up with 99% of what you're managing is infrastructure and nothing to do with actually delivering the application or the service that you're responsible for. So trying to keep, when you're trying to, to design a, like a pipeline or a, a new environment, trying to keep it very specific to just enough to get the application up and to deliver the application and you can work over and uh, repeat and improve this but if you try to just build everything all at once, uh, it can get, I think I wasted maybe three months just trying to decide Jenkins or Team City or what type of logging to have or all these things which you can't just uh, stop your business and say to your boss, hey, give us a year to go learn all this stuff and then when we get back, we'll do the next update, right? Um, so really thinking about taking a very narrow focus and you won't be happy with it, it won't be perfect. Uh, I'll talk more about that tomorrow, uh, sort of like a bootstrap um, DIY pipeline to get you just started. But uh, we really wasted a lot of time trying to understand or build things that were nice and we will we'll need them in the future, but you don't need them to start. Um, hopefully if you've got some good infrastructure around, uh, you can start to leverage existing things um, but in this particular case, uh, we picked a pilot application that was uh, a new team, that were a bit more open to a new way of doing things. We didn't have to worry about a lot of legacy stuff um, other than six months of development code that was pretty, pretty nasty. Um, but, and I, I think in the conversations we had at lunch and a few other people are really struggling with this. How do I make these choices? How do I decide which one is best for me? And, the problem is in the beginning, you can't answer that. You don't have enough experience, you don't really understand what the, the pain points are, um, and it can be difficult to, to get going. Can I just ask, uh, how many people are already doing either infrastructure as code or even like a CI pipeline uh, at work? Okay, and uh, did you guys start with kind of Greenfield? Did anyone, is anyone, is anyone doing that who's not working for like a, a web based uh, commerce platform, so in like enterprise, traditional enterprise. Okay, do you guys have any uh, kind of thinking on this, on how you guys got started and, and selected your tools? Did you kind of have problems around that or? Yep. Yep. And um, how did you find that like with your teams? Like did you mostly have kind of skill sets uh, going into that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so actually uh, that's, I was saying that at, at lunch is if you just automate what you're already doing, you just build technical debt faster, right? So, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think that's the key to trying to minimize. So so in our particular case, um, uh, in this there's quite a big skills gap. So it's not like. Um, so just to give you a bit of background, what I'm not in IT operations. I work for a network product vendor called Kemp. We do application delivery and load balancing. But our customers are making these transformations. We're supporting customers who are trying to deliver infrastructure in this mode. And so it's really important for us to understand 
what that requ that changes the requirements for our product, right? Not really the core technology, but how people want to deploy, how people want to do lifecycle management, logging, things like that. So it's really important for us to to understand these kind of methodologies, so we understand how to design our product, how how to train our support people, uh, how to train and equip our services teams. Um, and so we, we created an internal environment and uh, we took an internal application for our support teams that just publishes utilities and we started building uh, internal operations team to deliver that application um, using pre-sales support resources to expose them to this new way of working. So we had an opportunity to, to make a little bubble that we could operate in quite si safely. Um, I was very adamant it couldn't be a lab, it has to hurt a bit if you make a mistake, right? A lab is easy, right? You don't have to worry about budget or legacy code or hitting deadlines and things. Um, but we were quite lucky in, in, in that sense. But on the other side, where we have resources that are mostly network engineers and um, pro services engineers in a much more traditional kind of mindset. So there was quite a big skills gap and the more tools or infrastructure that were involved, the more that the the steeper the learning curve just to become functional was. So we tried to keep things very low and mostly work with just PowerShell. If, if you know PowerShell, everything is just driven from that and you don't need to worry about learning all these different technology sets um, too fast. So that was something that I think was helpful, especially if you're struggling with like a lot of legacy or even you don't have permission yet from your boss, maybe your KPIs and your metrics aren't set up right so switching to this kind of model could even like harm the way your team is measured. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of challenges like that or trying to integrate with other teams, right? You're doing it in, in your silo, but it's not something that you have buy-in from the whole company where everybody is on board with this. Um, okay. Next one, and this is very much a related term, is keeping your your design loose. Um, we had a, we were using a DSC. Um, in this case, we're configuring Linux uh, systems, and we selected Azure as the platform, and we were using the DSC for Linux uh, extension. We we hit quite a few hurdles um, with this. So we had a bunch of uh, legacy scripts that were doing the configuration in the build, and we were converting them over to DSC. And in the beginning, we ran them in parallel. So what we would do is we take one setting at a time and move it over to DSC, but then just run the rest of the script. And the idea was to just port that until there was, the script was just uh, empty, right? Um, straight away, we hit issues around uh, package management for DSC for Linux. So certain packages just don't get seen, like Python dash dev package does not exist. Um, if you do it as an X package resource. Um, we also had issues with things as common as my, um, MySQL server. So when that runs by default, it has an interactive prompt to put in the root password for the database. And again, DSC has no way to handle this. Uh, you can build script resources that kind of pre-populate uh, that password and things like that, but then you have plain text passwords in it, and it started to snowball quite quickly, right? I think we had to install about 10 packages, uh, Linux packages, and I think only three of them uh, worked uh, with the, the NX package, uh, and they weren't unusual packages. The next thing we hit was, uh, at least for the Ubuntu distribution, I, somebody told me today he's using it with CentOS and it works, but there's an issue with the installation of the DSC for uh, Linux extension. So it just fails to install when you uh, deploy the VM. So the, the result of that really was we, we picked Azure and made these choices because it seemed easy. It did a lot of the building blocks for us. We didn't need to build, again, we didn't need to build a full DSC infrastructure. We didn't need to have a lot of um, the supporting infrastructure in place and we could start very fast. But the problem was when we hit this issue, we were so locked into the platform, it was actually quite costly to back out of that and find another way. Um, now, well, in the long run, it, it works quite well because we moved to just using uh, PowerShell SSH to inject 
like a bootstrap script that would then just run a bunch of bash. Uh, and the good thing is now we're porting from Azure to Vagrant builds on the dev machines, and all we need to do is go from an ARM kind of platform deployment to a Vagrant script, but all of our configuration and things like that, we can still use all those same functions and routines. So we actually got a looser dependency. We had a lot of things hard-coded into the ARM templates and relying on the Azure platform to do it for us, which seemed very easy at first, but yeah, once you try to change that, you, you actually have to redo a lot of things. Um, so trying, I mean, obviously the, the higher up the stack, usually the, the easier it is to change, but especially like picking the platform you're running on and trying to isolate that, trying to isolate your config management and security things and not, not being too locked into that platform, at least early on until you really know that it does what you need and you, you're going to really commit to it. Um, that was, that costs, yeah, uh, so just a lot of time to go and rework everything and, and rebuild everything. Um, is anyone doing these kind of delivery models on public cloud platforms? Or, you, yeah, or everyone is on premise? Yeah. Uh, we, we will move to Paca at the moment, we don't, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's exactly what what you're trying to do, and that's something like Packer is really great. Is it gives you that agnostic solution for that part of the workflow, and it's I guess the challenge is trying to do that as many parts as you can, and especially in the beginning again, right? Like building uh, all of these things from scratch at the very beginning can uh, be quite a big investment to get started, but it's definitely worth it. So yeah, thinking about thinking about like lock-in and, and how platform specific what you're doing is um, was definitely something that, that we, we saw some issues around. Um, okay, any other comments on, and again, Anyone uh, who sort of has some experience here want to share anything uh, on this? Gail is always telling us to lose the test kitchen. Ah, yes. Yeah. 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 And and that's 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 I guess that's something that so that's something that's really so there's automation, right? And automation's a big part of kind of DevOps and, and things, but DevOps automation is not DevOps. Right? And I mean, I don't, I don't know what the sort of expectations were around that, but like, you know, a year to kind of get an outcome can be like, you might not have a year, right? And then that's always the pressure to like, just cut corners and, and deliver something, right? Um, there's a really big project that is very similar. It's data center in a box, right? So it's Azure pack based. They need to drop ship an entire data center um, anywhere basically in the world on demand with three days notice. Um, not to arrive, but to ship. There's to ship in three days, right? So some kind of business owner says, okay, I need a new site here. Click, this thing needs to be built and in three days and shipped. Uh, it was scheduled to go live after 24 months and uh, the, cost, uh, the like provider's now 36 months in and no working POC, right? And the problem they they have is they went straight to automation. Let's just automate everything. This is going to be awesome. Nobody ever went through the manual build process. They never actually decided what they need to automate. All the engineers ran off, started automating little pieces, but there was no workflow or design that does this even need to be automated, right? What are we trying to do? So there's a big risk in, in sort of confusing, okay, if we invest in automation, 
but we don't make the cultural change, the management change, the changing the expectations of how we're going to deliver incrementally, right? So that we're maybe instead of doing like the whole build, we're going to automate like this one bit, which will shave off like five minutes. And then this one will shave off another five minutes and you start to get stability and things like that, which also your boss needs to understand that, right? Because if you're not being measured that way, if they're like, no, it's, it's a sort of all or nothing, um, or how you're funded. We have another customer who wants to go full utility billing, on demand, everything like that. And the finance team said, oh, we have a ton of cash. What's the discount to buy right now? Right? And they said, okay, how much do you need? And they said, we don't know. That's the whole point. Right? We don't know how many we need. We can't scope this. The whole point is every month we will see what we are using and, and scope up but their, their finance model's just not set up that way. So it's really challenging to get the balance right. And I think that's where, I think you read a lot about this where you, you already have these things done, but it can be much more challenging, especially in an enterprise environment where you have a lot of legacy um, technology, but also legacy people and legacy thinking that are putting constraints or outsources have some contract that you can't change and things like that. Uh, okay, testing everything. Um, this was, uh, yeah, this was uh, interesting. Um, so originally, uh, there was some discussion about best practices, about tests, staging, production, and so on. And a decision was made that uh, staging seems like a, a waste of Azure resources, right? It's, it's just a, a duplicate. And... At the time, uh, yeah, it's pretty clear that, that that wasn't a great idea, but I guess I didn't articulate it well. So I, I couldn't come up with a really good explanation of why this worked. And at the time, it was pretty okay. We, um, in this particular situation, uh, test was a single, like, multi-role server, and so was production. So actually, there wasn't really any variation. But obviously, as you start to evolve, production gets more complex, load balancing comes in, you have dual server roles, things like that. So the drift between test and production builds up pretty fast. Uh, and um, this is where the, the production database got deleted. So <laughs> um, in staging, you're not testing your application. In staging, you're testing your workflow scripts and processes, right? So this. When you make a change here, you're using exactly the same workflow that you're using here, regardless of what that change is. Uh, in this case, the, the workflows broke. Uh, it didn't work, uh, which was fine until somebody said, no, we really need to stand this up today. And I logged into Azure portal, went down, found the server, delete, delete the disk. Can't delete, can't delete. Oh, it's locked. Why is the... Why is the disk locked? So obviously we have like automated naming. So there's only like two characters difference between FE server zero and DB server zero. So I deleted DB server zero. Luckily, the, the first routine is always back up production DB before anything else happens. So we just rebuilt it. But um, that, that's why you have staging. So now I can uh, explain that very clearly. Uh, and that's also why you invest in uh, backup and protections before you do anything else. Um, but I think that the thing here is, was getting our head around the differences between delivering the application and delivering the infrastructure, right? And you sort of almost have this dependent loop, right? And you're actually managing multiple pipelines in your head where you're trying to create and deliver uh, infrastructure code but you're also trying to create and deliver a pipeline for the application. And so you have these parallel uh, pipelines uh, that you're working with and uh, the different things uh, that are going through there. And I've seen this a couple of times too with people sort of under-investing in, in production-like systems. Uh, I had a few customers too where it, you start to lose meaning where, yes, your tests are passed, but your tests aren't a relevant uh, kind of check and um, also, I was talking to, to Rob earlier, and he had a good point too, where staging is the perfect place to test your rollback. So every time you're released to staging, test rolling it back. Then you know your rollback procedures work. 
rather than waiting to have a problem in production and the first time you try your rollback routine, it doesn't work, right? So I think that's an excellent point too, is, uh, is leveraging staging uh, or pre-production for that kind of rollback scenario. Um, is anyone using blue-green deployment methods? You guys are, yeah. Is anyone doing like CI delivery but not doing blue-green like models? Okay, so basically everybody's doing blue-green. So it depends. It's kind of hard, like you can't, so just for everybody what blue-green is, is, the idea is that rather than ever do an in-place update, you just build a new server, right? So you have the old copy and the new copy running side by side, and then you can either uh, introduce them both side by side and, and have some maybe like 5% of users on the new version, but it's not a big impact um, if there's a problem. Um, but the other version is still there. Uh, the way we do it is we don't do side by side. What we actually do is just use the load, we switch the load balancer to just uh, remove the previous one from the pool and add the new one in, right? So we just do a hard cutover, but that server's still running and it's literally one API call to the uh, load balancer to switch back, right? So the reason that this is a really useful model is uh, you don't need to worry about any kind of legacy drift or, or kind of managing configuration because it's always a fresh build. Um, and it's very fast rollbacks, so it's very low risk. But like you can't do blue-green exchange rollouts, right? That's, that's not going to happen, right? So there's, there's obviously this works fine if you're looking at like a web application, like fairly traditional web applications, and especially when you can separate the data layer, right? And this is obviously more like a front-end model, um, but you can also do that depending how much data, if you've got a petabyte of data to replicate, you're not gonna do this, but if you've got fairly light data sets, you can sort of migrate and move over as well, but it's mostly talking about that front-end web tier where you can kind of just rebuild and, and not worry too much about maintaining it. Are we going for time? Good. Yes. 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 <laughs> well, first of all, we had a protection in place, which was backup production database, which worked really well. Yeah, <laughs> worked very well. So um, since that we, so one of the things that was happening was, and I think again, this comes to like having the right culture and the mindset is that the development team was still so there was, there's three main types of changes that were sort of landing on, the, on us as the operations team. One is obviously when the application had a new release, like push this out and send it up. Uh, one was when there was a change to the topology or the design. So, okay, yeah, we want to split to like a two tier model instead of one tier, or we want to add in this or, or that, you know, like logging system and other things around the infrastructure. Uh, and then the third was sort of around our own Kind of pipeline and tools and things like that. Um, and, and also dependencies, making sure dependencies and things like that were in place. So the problem with this is they, they were trying to speed up their releases before we had like a full automated build and process in place. And they weren't distinguishing between, so there was like on Thursdays and Thursdays there was a test release, sorry, Tuesday there was a test release, Thursday was if that passed, go into production, right? But they wouldn't distinguish between, hey, we have this new version of the app and it's all packaged the same. And hey, we have a new version of the app. Uh, we have four more like package dependencies, three new file dependencies. Oh, and we want to split out to like a two tier model, uh, you know, like go, right? Um, so a lot of these changes started building up and but then that there was sort of still an expectation that, hey, you guys said you could do like a release on Tuesday and a release on Thursday. It's like, yeah, with, if you don't keep changing what a release is, right? Um, and when did you actually know about this? Like you probably added this package dependency like two weeks ago and you didn't tell us. So getting that thinking right. Um, so what we've done now is we've actually, um, we're still doing test releases, which that, that works fine. Because actually, the building process and configuration process works fine. What doesn't work is the workflow. So the workflow to update this more complex infrastructure has some problems. And there's also some Azure kind of commandlets that are, seem to have gone 
awry. So we've stopped doing production releases um, and refactoring the code around it to make it more testable. It, it, we were missing some of these cases. So we're actually refactoring all of that to make it easier to maintain and more testable to kind of prevent um, what happened. And the other thing um, that we've got kind of buy-in now is, yeah, like if, if this breaks, we don't do manual, like then the build just fails. Like we just roll back. We, we, we'll go back to the beginning, we'll work out what broke and we'll do it through that process and no one will say, nah, just log in and like ship it. Right, um, so that's that's the biggest one, right? There's a reason. There's a reason that people want immutable infrastructure. There's a reason people take away production logins and things like that. But sometimes you got to delete the production database before someone like will accept that that's okay. Unfortunately, right? And that's we designed this project to deliberately put ourselves in risky situations and go through the same kind of pain like our customers are. Like we knew we'd screw up. It hurts a little bit, but it's just an internal app. It's pretty easy. Actually, even just to manually build it, I can manually build the whole thing in like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So it's not really something that has a huge impact. It's not gonna take down the business, but it's a great kind of learning process. Um, well, I didn't plan to delete the tip. It's like, where's Chrissy or Rob? They're not in here, thank God. Um, yeah, no, that, that obviously wasn't the plan. So the, I think the thing is, like you read, like this is best practice, this is how people want to do things, but you don't necessarily have the why. And especially if there's pressure from management, like why? Like this is going to cost more money, it's going to take longer, this seems stupid. It can be hard to really articulate that, but then you go through an event like that and like nobody really asks questions when you say, hey, like we need to do this better. So it, it was deliberately set up a little bit artificially to, to kind of push ourselves through this kind of process and try and understand it kind of more in your heart than in an abstract kind of logical way. Like, it, yeah. So yeah, we're, we're putting more things around it, but we actually have to refactor to do that. It, it got a bit cruddy. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyone, anyone have any particular kind of comments around, around how they're doing, particularly doing infrastructure testing? Is anyone using PESTA to do infrastructure validation? Yeah, yeah. Um, anyone using something else to test their infrastructure or anyone not testing their infrastructure? Yeah, custom scripts. Yeah, so um, another thing that came up uh, was Gail's uh, configuration data. Um, talk and managing config data, which is obviously a big problem when you scale. And someone uh, asked me, so how do you manage configuration data? And I kind of laughed and said, we don't. <laughs> that's the problem. Um, yeah, but that's a, uh, watch Gail's video if you went there. Okay, um, so we talked about this a little bit. Um, I got a bit ahead of myself. Uh, I apologize, like a lot of this stuff doesn't come out. These are little servers, but it's very white. And it doesn't come out very well. Uh, this is the blue-green model. So um, we moved to this fairly quickly, even when we just had a uh, like single-tier multi-role server. And this saves you so much time, and it reduces so much risk. So the idea is basically um, you have whatever your current kind of version is. Um, we always have like an N-1 kind of version like coming up. This is the previous one, so this is just shut down. Um, so we can roll back, and then after that, it just gets trashed. So if you've got a new release, you just build a whole new server, and everything just moves one step along. This becomes previous, it just gets stopped. Um, this moves over, and then we have the next one there, and it's sort of like staging um, type thing, or we can give, like, uh, for UAT, we can give early access and stuff like that. And in front of it, we just have one of our load balancers, and again, we just switch and redirect um, where the traffic is pointing. And uh, we're, we're just doing it on a server per server basis. But again, like this could be a server pool and another like server pool, it, it scales up. Uh, if anything goes wrong, you pretty much just hit the back button. And correct. Yep. Uh, for us, it's not very long. We don't do it for very long, but yes. Yeah. Um, and then literally, 
again, like you just hit the back button. There's no uninstall, there's no rollback. You just switch your server pools and your load balancer. Yes. Yeah, so obviously data is, data is, persistent data is the most kind of challenging thing. So what we have is any, and this is more like based on a policy, it's, I mean, we're sort of relying on our scripts to enforce this, but we have an automated procedure to back up the database. And so any, any workflow that changes, um, actually anything in test or staging as well, the first thing it does is back up the production database. So we always, whatever change we just made, we have a snapshot of the database the instant before that happened. So that if we do find a corruption, like we're guaranteed that we've got minimal loss, of, of, it's basically how long does it take us to work that out. Um, but that's something we implemented as part of the standard workflow. Every workflow starts with backup production database. Yeah. 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 It is hard work. So like we have a quite small database. So and we have a schema change pending now. Right, so the plan is actually we will not update the database because it's quite a small data set. We will build a new database, we will replicate over, we will switch all the front end servers to the new one, but the old ones, the whole server is still sitting there. Um, it, and the thing is in Azure and stuff like that and VMs, even in Azure, just turn it off, it doesn't cost you anything, right? Keep it there a month or whatever, it's not a big investment. Um, it's not like you're actually like using hardware boxes to do this. Um, but it's, we, we've had, okay, the deleting the database is like a, like stupid thing, right? But we've had like a lot of failures where like the impact was essentially zero. It, it's like one API call, it just like flick. We, we've made a wrapper function that just says switch active server, right? And you just, um, Yeah, yeah, so um, um, like we, so we still have planned kind of release schedules. So we sort of have like a window to do it. It's quite short, it's only about like 15 minutes. Um, but that's on purpose. We don't really need that much more than that. Cause it, like I said, this is, it's a real app, but it's pretty small, right? Um, so, and then we have validation and testing that kind of says, okay, like, no. So we actually, again, in the load balancer, we can like, like bleed off active users. So we know no one's actually on it. Um, but I think it's quite challenging. I'm sure, I mean, Netflix doesn't say like, sorry, unavailable for 10 minutes, right? Somebody's solved this. Um, but persistence data and protecting your persistence data is like probably one of the most difficult issues and like always will be, right? You can't just trash out like trash user data um, or business data. Um, but you can take that risk way, way down with the right kind of procedures, but it takes time to get to that. I guess that's, that's kind of one of the, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so actually one of the things is I wanna separate those changes, I don't, but at the moment, like all changes just kind of happen like all in one quote unquote release. So there could be database changes, application changes and infrastructure changes that are all going at one time, which is, yeah, which is horrible. Yeah, it's like terrible. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, correct. And that that's sort of the thinking there is that we would we'd take the like the last front end and the back end and then move them forward together and then build a whole new front end back end if there was like a back end change so that you've got that alignment. And then if you roll back, you'd have to roll back both front end and back end at the same time. Um, mo mostly it's not so much you say, okay, here's a risk, like how can we how can we like handle that if it happens? It's actually trying to find situations where it doesn't matter. Like that's the kind of whole idea of like blue green is don't worry about what if somebody changed something on that server or what if there was an update and we didn't know about it. How do we do in place upgrades and then how do we do it have like an uninstall mechanism? It's well, let's not even do that. Let's just build a whole new one. And if you've got an automated build process that doesn't take very long, right? Um, and again, it, it, there's definitely it's not that easy. It's it's a lot of work, um, even for a fairly small. This is just a Django, like um, that's a Python web framework app with my MySQL backend, fairly minimal kind of stuff around it. It's still a lot of work. Yeah. Um, what are we doing? Okay, I don't want to keep people from deer, especially myself. Okay. <laughs> I'm an Aussie. Um, okay, second, um, so this, I touched on this, right? So this is, the, so this, I forgot I had this slide. This is actually the, the mechanism we use um, in all our workflows. So rather than the guy at the top that just kind of goes, let's go change the app layer. Hey, I can change the app layer like I'm not touching the database. Any workflow, no matter where it's touching, the first step in the workflow is back up the production database, right? So because there's so many things like we've heard before, oh no, this won't, this won't impact that, like, trust me, right? <laughs> um, and obviously like reading anything that's kind of like reading your data, probably okay, like it's not a big deal, but as soon as there's rights involved, you know, that's, that's, a huge, um, that's a huge deal. I saw a good model that somebody else used um, where they actually completely, I think they were using Redis um, data storage uh, and they use some Redis clustering, and what they'd managed to do is ensure that actually um, they had completely different read-write pools, and their master set was only ever read. Sorry, the, the front ends never touched the master set. So they always had a way to like read um, from kind of duplicates or slave copies, and then when they had rights, they had a kind of service, a microservice in front of that that had a whole bunch of control that gave them a lot of abstraction away from the data stores. Um, but yeah, so that's one thing we implemented that definitely, you know, okay, instead of a 15 minute release, it took me like 45 minutes, but it was okay, right? So that's something we, we got into pretty early on. Um, and so some of it's not just technology, it, it's how you design that workflow, it's how you kind of set expectations about what you're doing in a release. I know, the system's data, tips, tricks. Yeah, it's, um, but yeah, protecting your data is, uh, Okay, so yeah, I'm not quite as happy as that little guy there, but um, yeah, so the, the kind of big ones that we've sort of come across and, and particularly, so this is really meant to be like getting started. If you have, if, I mean, there's a few guys here that are in much more mature situations, which is awesome. But for us, it was really understanding like, okay, from ground zero, no skills, no existing kind of stuff to leverage. Um, how do, how do, what does it look like going through this, right? Uh, and so definitely thinking about, the problem is, is you don't know enough probably about how to make the right choices about the technologies. And if you overinvest too early and you've got to roll that back and it can be quite costly and you lose a lot of time in training or learning or committing on something you're gonna move. So keeping the scope of what you're trying to do quite small in the beginning, um, I think is really critical. Um, and you also, you're not just testing 
and managing the application. You're testing and managing your infrastructure. So the bigger that infrastructure is, the more work that is, right? And the more things that can go wrong. So keeping the scope of that, you know, just enough to stand the app up and then go back and kind of bring in more security, more management, more uh, monitoring and visibility around it, rather than trying to build this big bang approach from day one, I think it's really important. Um, making sure you're designing for failure. Like, you, one day you will delete the production database, right? It'll happen. Or well, somebody will do it, a contractor will do it, right? Um, so kind of just having that in your mind, right? Designing for failure rather than just kind of hoping that everything goes according to plan. Um, and, and sort of related to your infrastructure, keeping loose linkages, especially on the platform, especially if you're using public cloud kind of stuff, it's so easy to go, oh, this is awesome, like Azure does everything, I just need to put it in my ARM template. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't go quite as smoothly. Uh, and really testing everything, which by that I don't mean the application, but like testing your own workflows, testing your own infrastructure scripts and, and your own routines. Um, that was definitely a bit of a blind spot for us. We were very focused on the application and the things around that and didn't do a good enough job of looking at our own kind of services there. And I think that's where you, you know, there is quite a lot of work to do uh, to get started, but trying to just stand up something, right? Don't get 30 months in with no working POC. We just started with a manual process, then we took it from manual into scripts, then we started wrapping config management around the scripts. You can't just go from zero to 100, right? There is a process where you know that in the long term, this is the wrong way, but it's still a step in the right direction. It's still one more thing that's automated. It's still one more thing that's tested. But don't, don't not start because you don't have everything ready because that's the only way you're going to learn it. And then just make sure you pick a well-scoped project where you can learn, but you don't bankrupt your company or get fired. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, we're right on time. Awesome, I actually made it. I did not test my timing at all. Don't tell device. Uh, thanks everybody for your time and thanks for the people, especially with some experience in this, kind of sharing your ideas and things like that. Um, we also have the Ask the Experts room where everybody around DevOps, DSC and things is kind of hanging out at lunch. So if you just want to come around and have lunch and chat, um, Matt Hitchcock's usually there who uh, he's doing credential management tomorrow, and he did, what did he do? Uh, so he did like a, a proper TFS release pipeline. Um, be around, Gael is usually around. Uh, and then tomorrow I'm doing, uh, I'm actually showing, so we build a DIY uh, release pipeline just using PowerShell and Azure, uh, by which I mean just Azure for infrastructure, not using um, anything there. And the, the reason behind that was again to lower the bar of dependencies, all you need to know is PowerShell. Uh, and really learn and study the workflow that a more mature automation solution is doing. But it can be a bit black box. So you see something like TFS, you commit, and then things go green, and it's kind of hard to understand what the workflows are being implemented underneath, how to manage artifacts, right, and dependencies and files. So we deliberately implemented a, a manual PowerShell-based pipeline so that we could really kind of inspect all those workflows. And again, we didn't need to go around and learn like 50 different tools and seven different data structures to, to kind of get up and running. So that'll have more code in it tomorrow. Uh, but again, it'll be more like an architecture and kind of model design that we, we found useful. So um, if you're interested, I think after lunch or something like that. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Nobody fell asleep. <laughs>